Rod Culbertson is a friend to many. Uh, Rod is known to most of us here. He commented before the service, he looked around and could recognize most of the faces here because he's been serving us and befriending us in many, many ways down through many years. You know, Rod finished up at Columbia International University after his sojourn at the University of South Carolina, uh, got his MDiv, got his doctorate, DMIN at Reformed Theological Seminary, along the way engaging as a friend uh, to students. He was the first RUF uh, representative in the state of Florida and served students, was a friend to students at, at Gainesville for nearly a decade. And then he served as a friend in the pastoral role in a church that he and his wife planted in Clearwater, Florida. And then as an ass assistant pastor, as, as, as uh, stated supply pastor, uh, still continuing to do a good bit of that even today. But now we know him most recently as in his role as the associate professor for pastoral theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, in, in Charlotte. Jackson's where I went, so that's kind of what I think about in Charlotte. But uh, we, who, who among us, uh, if we've been here very long, has not called on him in his friendship role, in his uh, consummate approachability, in his uh, accessibility to give us advice to point us in the right direction. We may have been looking for a staff pastor or want to check somebody out, you know. He knows all these, all these seminary boys and he has background and he's frank and honest and a great resource to us when we call on him. So a great friend of students, college level, seminary level, a great friend of churchmen such as we are. When I was thinking about this key characteristic that I think in terms of when I think of him, of the friendship, these songs kept coming into my head. Uh, I couldn't decide which one I should use as a background theme. There was the one with a Woody and Buzz Lightyear, You've Got a Friend in Me. But then a guy of my uh, era, also the great Carol King song that James Taylor made, made so famous, uh, You've Got a Friend. So I gave up trying to decide between them and thought I would just simply say at the end of this introduction, and it good to know that we've got a friend in Rod Culbertson. I don't know what to say about that introduction. Uh, I hope somebody was recording it. I'll take it to my wife. But uh, intriguingly, uh, before I became a Christian, my favorite song was You've Got a Friend by James Taylor because I didn't really have any friends. And Christ brought me into a body of believers and I began to value friendship, of course, more and more. So that's pretty uh, striking there. But thank you again for the privilege of being here. And yes, I know a lot of you all, and uh, I have been licensed in this presbytery before you divided. So I've been in this presbytery for 22 years licensed. I think I'm getting my license renewed uh, today and hope the sermon uh, doesn't uh, create a problem there. So, but um, yes, my privilege, uh, welcome. Uh, from Reform Seminary in Charlotte and all campuses everywhere, Dan, uh, we greet you. So I invite you, if you would, to turn with me to God's Word here in Jeremiah uh, chapter uh, 1. I'm actually going to start in verse 4 and uh, then we'll read uh, 17 through uh, 19. So this is the Word of God and let us give our attention to it now. Jeremiah 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. 
But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Verse 17, but you dress yourself for work, arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I will make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. And may indeed God bless this, the reading, hearing, and preaching of his word, and let's ask for his blessing uh, even now. Pray with me. <coughs> Father, we gather together. We have worshiped you. We have sung your praise. We have called out uh, to you. We have confessed our need for you, which is constant. Uh, we thank you that we can be here. We're in the service of your church here in this Presbytery meeting. Pray you will be present here. May your spirit work. Get this sinner out of the way. And uh, may you speak to each one of us those words that we need to hear, Lord, in our hearts. Uh, we just pray for your leading and guiding now. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. His father passed away when he was four years old. He was the sixth of nine children, and being poor, he received at best a fourth or fifth grade education. He didn't even like books. He professed faith in Christ at the age of 18, so he went to the nearby congregational church. He wanted to join. He sat before the pastor and their deacons, and he failed the interview. They wouldn't let him join. They said, come back next year. So he came back the next year, and he passed the interview, but they told him, you barely passed. At age 35, however, after years of various service and ministry and volunteer work, he caught on fire for God and would burn for the next almost 30 years. And in spite of his great personal deficiencies, God would use D.L. Moody to bring revival to both America and to Great Britain. And if God can use someone with those inadequacies and those insufficiencies, God can use you and me. Ministry is a calling that involves not our own sufficiency. Ministry or kingdom service depends upon the sovereign power of an ever-present and active God. And so our case study this morning is Jeremiah, a prophet of Judah, called in 626 B.C. or so, when the mighty nation of Babylon was hovering over God's people, kind of like a vacuum cleaner ready to sweep them up and take them home. A people who were spiritually dry, destitute, disobedient, kind of like our culture today. That was his calling. And worse yet, you may know his nickname, the weeping prophet. He was a man of sensitive nature. 
introspective, internalizing things. This would be no easy task for a man like this. But the first thing we see in our passage today is that ministry is not about me. It's not about me. Verses 4 and 5, God calls Jeremiah to be his spokesman. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. God is speaking to him. And I assume if all of you are elders of some nature here, somewhere along the line, God has spoken to you and called you to whatever role you are playing in the kingdom. Jeremiah's response is... I'm incapable, I'm inadequate, I'm untrained, I didn't earn a Master of Divinity degree anywhere. He's unsure of himself, but kingdom service ministry is when God calls us to do things we are unsure about. We're unsure about ourselves. Jeremiah says, I can't speak. I'm weak. I do not know how to speak. I lack the ability. I'm inexperienced. I'm not a public speaker. It's not on my resume. The word there, no, of course, is that common biblical word, yada, Jeremiah Speaking and I, we are not friends. We are not face to face. When I was in high school, I could not even make a phone call to the store. I was shy, withdrawn, a loner in many ways. My mother would say, Call the store, see when they close. I was sure they would begin to burst out laughing at my incompetency. Jeremiah says, I can't speak. Not only that, I'll build my argument. I'm young. Probably not a child, probably not a boy, because he says he's a priest, but he's young, he's a youth, he's a young man. He feels he is inferior for this task. Yes, he's sensitive. He's emotional. He's trying to draw it all inside and he's just not mature enough. He knows he, he doesn't have the credibility. My favorite ride as a child when we went down to Myrtle Beach every summer and sometimes you find them at other places was called the wild mouse. You know, I'm talking about the wild mouse. It's a one person roller coaster cab that you would get in and it would take you and jerk you up and down and around and all over. And I don't know why, but I was just thrilled with that. But you know what? I had to wait for a while because there was a sign. You must be this tall to ride the wild mouse. how Jeremiah feels like he's been called to ride the wild mouse and he's, he's not very tall. And y'all, ministry is a lot like the wild mouse. It will jerk you up and down and around in the corners that you don't know what's coming. God says, do not be afraid of them. The word there means to stand in awe or dread. Jeremiah is basically expressing the thought, I don't feel very good about this situation. I can't do it. I'm inadequate and God senses it because he's really saying, I'm terrified. <laughs> I dread this. You, God, have the wrong man they won't like me if I take your message. And history tells us he had 42 years of very tough ministry, maybe one or two converts. 
and lots of tears. A lifetime of ministry, but Jeremiah, it's not about you. Ministry and kingdom service is not about me. Ministry is about God. It's about what God plans and what God says. And how does God respond to Jeremiah to encourage him? In verse 5, he says, I have known you before I formed you in the womb I knew you. It's that same word, Yada, I knew you. I'm intimately acquainted with who you are, Jeremiah. God has a plan for Jeremiah's calling. He has a plan for each one of us. And God would be saying, Jerry, you are here by my design. I know you. I have formed you in the womb. The word there speaks of fashioning, shaping, purposing, ordaining. And I will tell you, I stagger like Jeremiah staggered in my own ministry, even preaching to Presbytery. But I tell the students, the thing that gives me confidence is I do believe, and it does make me Reformed and Presbyterian, I'm on this earth for this purpose, to minister, to lift up Christ, to serve God, I hope, till the very end, faithfully. I have formed you. I have consecrated you. I have set you apart. God's purpose for Jeremiah. He has made each one of us uniquely to be used by him. We are to accept and rejoice in our uniqueness, even if we sense we are inadequate, because it's God's design, it's God's choice, it's God's appointing. He is not limited by our limitations. He can supersede those. And so we don't look around at others, other ministers, other churches, and do the comparison game, which is our temptation, of course. We look at God and recognize He has a plan for me, for us in his kingdom. I have appointed you. The word there means to put, place, set, assign, designate. I put you right there where you belong. The word came and Jeremiah, you are the man for the hour for what I am going to do. He had no choice. It was God's plan, God's will, God's call. And God has given him a personal assurance or reassurance that God has put him there. I often wondered how I got here where I am, and I never planned to be at a seminary and circuitous route. And Dr. Steve Brown once said this, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> How do we get where we are it's God's doing. It's the surprising sovereign hand of God. God says, I will deliver you in verse 8. 
And if Jeremiah had a cell phone in that day, he would have pulled it out and he would have started texting God and he would have said this, you say you'll deliver me, but Lord, that word deliver means to rescue from harm or danger. I don't like that thought. And God would say, you're right. I haven't promised you a carefree life. And indeed, he is a man who is rejected, scorned, jailed, beaten, thrown into a cistern. He suffers, but God's watchful eye is active in the midst of his troubles. Verse 9, I will enable you. I have put words in your mouth. And wasn't that Jesus' promise to his disciples that he would give them the words to speak in the circumstances that would seem to be difficult and they wouldn't know what to do? And what are those words? Verse 10, mostly a message of judgment. None of us wants to raise our hand to do that. And yet the time, we see the time. We live in the time, certainly in our nation. But not just judgment, because there will be some restoration, some hope. To pluck up, break down, destroy, overthrow, to build and to plant. You're going to preach this message of condemnation in my judgment, but someday, and Jeremiah does not see or fully understand the big picture. The big picture is, yes, God will come and judge, but God will restore his, his channel of redemption. And it'll be a few centuries, but he will bring his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come and shed his blood Die on a cross. Be raised again. Building and planting and growing his church. Ministry is not about me as much as, as I can fall into that mentality. It is about God. God's work, God's doing. And so we learn, thirdly, that ministry is about responding to God. Verse 17, but you dress yourself for work. The NIV says, get yourself ready. The old King James, gird up your loins. Well, who knows what that means, right? So these other, but it's the robe. It's the long, heavy, flowing robe. Pull it up, get a sash in your belt and tie it, and then get in there. Get busy. Get to work. Forget about your inadequacies. Throw yourself into the task with vigor. Speak for me. Don't be dismayed by them. Verse 18, behold, I will make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls. You will overcome, Jeremiah. You will be able because I will do the work. You will be a victor. You will prevail. Israel will be judged. But Jeremiah will fulfill his task. He does ride the wild mouse for a while, but he does finish. He, fi he fulfills his task, weeping till the end and beyond. God gives him these three metaphors of strength. Fortified city with strong walls, defense mechanisms, a pillar of iron, a wall of 
bronze, strength, protection, security in God in the midst of the challenges, the trials. I grew up next door to a political celebrity as a young boy. And that political celebrity uh, was my uncle, my uncle John Bolt Culbertson. Uh, he um, was actually engaged in civil rights before there was technically a civil rights movement. He was a lawyer who was fighting for the rights of blacks in the state of South Carolina, but also for poor whites. Anyone that needed defense, he defended them. The Ku Klux Klan burned a cross on his front yard, so he moved from his prominent location to the location where I grew up next door to him. And I watched as a young boy, he, he had this rock house and he doubled it. And I watched him as he doubled this big rock stone, what I call eccentric mansion. And I played in it while they were building it and all. And eventually it took a few years for him to finish it. But it wasn't until about three years ago that I found out, discovered why he built this big rock mansion with walls this thick. It was because with those thick walls, he could uh, prevent firebombs and assault weapons as he continued his, his journey of defending the poor and speaking for the blacks. Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to be, make you like a fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls against the whole land, kings of Judah, officials. The list goes on and on. Ministry is about responding to God no matter how you feel about yourself because he is God. And getting involved in the task. And, and by the way, I meant to say earlier, I appreciate your ministry in the local church as pastors and ruling elders. I've done that. I've been there. Uh, I have some of the same kinds of problems even with students at times. And it's challenging it is not easy. But God is the one who calls us. He's the one who will strengthen us. We respond to him. Ultimately, he says in verse 19, and he says this twice in the text, I am with you. Wonderful promise. I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Yes, hard. I'll be there. I will take care of you. Dan mentioned that I got my Master of Divinity degree at Columbia International University. It's not a Reformed school. There were some Reformed professors there, but I got a very, very good training there. I had the pleasure of sitting under a man, and I've said this in front of our own faculty. I sat under a man who was the greatest teacher I have ever heard. I sat under him for a few courses. This man... He never got a doctoral degree. We just knew him as Mr. Hatch or Buck Hatch. He was a man who, as he grew up, was beaten down. He grew up in a dysfunctional family. He grew up with great insecurities. He grew up with the lowest of self-esteem, low self-esteem, and he never overcame low self-esteem. His wife had to propose to him. <laughs> he couldn't do it. You would see him on campus, and he might speak, but mostly he just liked to kind of acknowledge you and go like this and move on to his office or whatever else. And yet he was used greatly in the kingdom of God. Why? <laughs> because... He never seemed to get in God's way. 
his favorite course to teach? The prophets. His favorite prophet? Jeremiah. Why? Because Jeremiah was the man whom God could use even though he felt inadequate, insufficient, unable. Can God use you in your inadequacy and your weakness and your questioning and your introspection and all of those things? Can he use you? He would love to. And this table this morning reminds us how much he loves us that he will indeed intervene as our Lord and Savior and give us the strength and ability that only comes from him. Let's pray. Father, we do bow before you and each one of us here, Lord, I doubt if there's anyone here that thinks they are adequate. They probably shouldn't be here. And we need you and we need your Holy Spirit strengthening us and enabling us and reassuring us. And we pray this table indeed will strengthen our faith, the assurance of your presence with us. And I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.